afternoon. Uh, my name is Maddie Whittle. I am a member of the programming team at Film at Lincoln Center and the programmer of our summer free talks uh, this year. And it's my great pleasure and honor to welcome you, the audience, and our guests to uh, today's free talk featuring director Jairo Bustamante, whose film La Llorona uh, was released earlier this month. And uh, we are really excited to have him here with us to talk about the film. It's a, it's a really meaty, um, thoughtful, complicated film. And I think it's, a, it's gonna be a real fodder for conversation. Um, just to say a few things before we kick off. Um, this summer, we have moved our year round free talks series into the virtual realm. Uh, so if, you've, if you haven't been able to join us uh, for previous events, you can check those out on our web, uh, our YouTube channel rather. Um, all of the talks from the summer uh, were recorded and then posted. Uh, so you can check those out. We have some really great conversations on the books. Uh, thank you, first of all, to our presenting partner, HBO, who works with us every year on our, uh, as a year-round supporter of the Free Talks series. Uh, thank you this time also for sh to Shudder, the, who, the, who is releasing uh, Hyro's film, and who, without whom this event wouldn't be possible. We're really uh, appreciative. They've been great to work with. Um, thanks also to our members, patrons, sponsors, and year-round audiences for uh, supporting us all the time, but especially during this period of our theater closure uh, during, during the quarantine. We've um, had to move our current programming all online and it's been uh, a really interesting and exciting summer sort of seeing how Art House film exhibition can work in that space. So we thank you all for your support. Uh, just a few quick announcements before we dive in. Uh, we are rolling out the uh, lineup of this year's New York Film Festival, which is running from September 17th through October 11th. It's longer this year than normal years um, because of the scheduling around our uh, drive-in venues. You may have heard that we will be, uh, the festival will be taking place online and in a few drive-in venues around the city. Um, so you can find out all the information about this year's festival lineup on our website, filmlink.org. And uh, you should know that the ticket pre-sale for members begins on Tuesday next week, September 1st. And then the uh, pre-sale for general audiences begins on September 11th. So definitely keep an eye on that. Uh, and so without any further ado, I just wanna dive in uh, to this conversation. I'll, I'll leave our, our uh, interlocutors to, to talk in just a moment, but first I'll just say a few words about them. Uh, the moderator of today's conversation is Carlos Aguiar, uh, who's originally from Mexico City and is an alum of the Roger Ebert Fellowship for Film Criticism. Uh, his work has appeared in the Los Angeles Times, Remezcla, and IndieWire, among other publications. Uh, and you can find him on Twitter. He's, uh, I, I can't recall his handle, but uh, I'm sure he can mention it if he, if he wants to. Uh, and then finally, the man of the hour is Jairo Bustamante, who is a Guatemalan director and screenwriter. His first film, Ishkanul, was Guatemala's entry for the Best Foreign Language Film Oscar in 2016, after it premiered to uh, great acclaim at festivals in 2015. And uh, the last year, 2019, saw him on the festival circuit uh, with both his second and third feature films. The second is called Tremors. It was released theatrically last November by Film Movement. And then finally, his third feature film, which is going to be the topic of conversation today, although the conversation may go beyond uh, this film, but uh, La Llorona was released online by Shudder earlier this month. And uh, so you can check it out if you haven't seen it already. Uh, we are really, really excited to get to um, sort of create this conversation around it today. So without any further ado, uh, thank you all again for joining us and please join me in welcoming Carlos and Jairo. Thank you so much for, for having us. I'm excited to, to chat with Jairo about this incredible film. Um, and thank you to the Film Lincoln Center for hosting us. Uh, Jairo, I wanted to start by you know, asking you about your interest in the horror uh, genre. It was this interest based on, on, on an intention to try a new vehicle for storytelling? Or was it, you know, that you found this will be the best vehicle for this type of story uh, in terms of the genocide in Guatemala? Oh, hi, Carlos. Very happy to, to talk with you again. Thank you for supporting the film and, and following my, my career. 
and you know i'm not that kind of director that want to be specialized in in one gender or one type of type of films i really enjoy the cinematic message or language and and i want to if i can i i really dream to make different styles of films and use different genders and but for this film i was wondering how tell the story about my country who is the recent recent story about my country if i know that my country don't want to talk about that because it's a kind of a taboo talk about the war even if it just happened 20 years ago you know and so I decided to make a study to understand which kind of films Guatemalan people are watching. And because I was sure that it's not dramas or um, author, cinema d'auteur. Uh, so I, we discovered in that study that in Guatemala people are watching superheroes films and horror films. So we decided to use that information and to bring that message that we wanna we wanna bring, and we started looking for a way to mix these two genders in, in a film, and and we just remember our Llorona, you know, La Llorona in Mesoamerica is very very important. He, she's a kind of an icon. She's a kind of a heroine, even if I don't don't understand why, because the real legend is not very heroic. But, and at the same time, she's coming from a uh, horror universe. So the decision to, to use the horror um, gender to, to tell this film was at the beginning very, very strategic. But after that, we could justify each of our intention using uh, the, gen the genre. Uh, in that kind, because it was very normal to use horror when you want to talk about a genocide. It was very, very logic use horror when you want to talk about a, a man who permit that kind of massacres. So it's a kind, it's a kind of talk about the evil, and. And that permit us to use La Llorona, like the icon that she is, but transform it and put out this kind of machismo that the original legend have, has and, and transform a little bit La Llorona and make, make this character more justicier and not just a woman who, has cry, who is crying because a man quit her. Right. And in that process of you know of diving into this new genre of horror, what was that you know the process of writing it and sort of like learning the language of this genre, you know, creating moments of tension uh, in order to serve the narrative that you were creating? Uh, was it difficult to enter this new form, or, or uh, was it you know enjoyable to perhaps have new tools to to be able to play with? Oh, for sure, it was difficult, um, but not because as difficult, you know, it was difficult because oral gender is a very, very enjoyable um, tool. So it's very, very, I was so happy using that because when you are writing, you can really feel or imagine, imagine how the audience will, re will, will react about that you are writing because oral permit you a lot of, of of freedom, even even if you start your scene announcing what will happen at the end, we know it. And like an audience uh, who loves horror, we want to arrive at the end just to be sure that it, there is a monster at the end. So I think the most problematic part was not make a traditional horror movie and say, the, gen the genre have to be there, but the the reality of the story that I'm I'm telling have to be there too. So we we create a kind of a balance to put 
a little bit of horror, a, bit, a little bit of, of reality, a little bit of fantasy and a little bit of history. And we were working with this balance all the time. So, but it was a very, very good, good, enjoyable and nice process. Work with gender is, is fascinating. And on the visual and, and you know, atmospheric side, uh, was it something new that you learned in terms of, you know, using the resources or the budget that you had to create a horror film and make it, you know, give it that sort of, uh, uh, yeah, the atmosphere and the, the eerie feeling that, uh, that comes with the territory? Oh, yeah, that was a challenge because we really had a very small budget. So... We start thinking about the very classic of horror, and and one of that classic is is Dracula. And if there is something that I really like about Dracula is the fact that that he is very elegant, and he is not. There is some films or some some versions, but it's not a monster, you know, with this terrific face. And normally, it's a it's a very elegant man. And so we wanted to do the same. We, we, we wanted to, to don't use um, effects in, in our Girona. And we said, if Dracula can be this Transylvanian prince, maybe we can make La Girona like a Mayan princess. And, and like that, we didn't have a, need to transform her with special effects. And, and after that, we wanted to use daylight in, in our scenes too. Not being in a, in a night film, just because it's an, an horror film. We wanted to use both, but I really appreciate that kind of films where the light is there and we still feeling oppression and we still feeling fear. So that's helped us too, to can be, uh, build that world. Um, and after that, the fact to be um, in that house and closed by, by something coming from the outside, uh, like you know, the the big the, the best reference in that is is The Shining or The Others, all that film that the, the characters are in a house and and there is a forest outside. Then you can you cannot go out. So we are we are looking for that forest and we discover our manifestant or people uh, people who were uh, outside and. And they became so important because thanks to them, we can tell a lot of things only by the sound. All, only by the sound we, we could tell how a country, uh, an entire country feel about that, that um, uh, story. So at the end, this small budget serves us a lot to create and, and find another uh, ways to tell the story. Totally. I wanted to shift the focus to, to talk about Rigoberta Menchu, the Nobel Prize uh, winner, uh, who's been influential throughout your career and who makes a cameo uh, in, in the film. Tell me about your relationship with her and how did she come to, to be in the film? Oh, you know, I really admire her from I was a kid and and I remember that I at that time I live in Paris and each time that she came to Paris and made some conferences I was there just to to dreaming to have an uh, a sign in my books and and all that and and once when I finish Ishkanu I, I, I call her foundation to ask her if, if, if she loves the film and, and she told me for sure, yes, and I want to help you. And she came with me to, to LA to make the, the Oscar career when, 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 when we were working on. And, and after that, she became a kind of um, 
advisor, a friend. And, and when I start working with La Llorona, because like I said in Guatemala, that, that subject is very, very complicated. Not La Llorona, but the genocide. It's very complicated. And, and La Llorona, my, my first intention to make the film, it was an, an insult and the insult is communist. And normally in Guatemala, we start using communists to say the enemies and the enemies was, was at that time the communist. But right now there is nothing to do with the political way. Right now, the communists are the enemy, the state enemy, the, the government enemy. So, so I called Rigoberta to ask, how can I tell this story if, if people who defend human rights or people who want to tell about the, the, the recent history in the country are, are considered the enemies? And so she, she, she was really supporting me uh, to tell this story. And, 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 I've, I can, and I say to myself, if, if she support a lot of, of attacks against herself, maybe my film can support it too. And, and I lost the fear to make a film. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that, the trial sequence, which I think is one of the most powerful scenes uh, in, in the film, where we see Rigoberta sitting uh, behind uh, this fictional uh, dictator who represents sort of Rio's month uh, in reality. Um, but there's also the actress, you know, who, who testifies uh, covered with the uh, sute. Uh, tell us about shooting that scene, which I think is very crucial for the film. Oh, that scene was so, so emo emotional for us because all the people who work in the film, like, uh, like support actors or extras, I, I don't want to call them extras because they made a very great job, like uh, actors. They were involved in, in organization to, to look for the people to look for um, disparate people. They are victims from the, con from the conflict. They continue working to build a bridge between the army and the, um, the Mayans who suffer about that. They are really involved in the, in the subject. So it was, it was a very, very complicated scene because we were working with real feelings and with real people. And, and the, this actress who, who wrote the play, given the, the confidence, she, when I started working with, with her, she, she asked me, can I change some little lines in the script? Because that you wrote, it's so similar to my life that if I change two little things, it's almost mine. So it will be easy for me. And, and when she proposed me, how she wants to tell the story. And she made it with this kind of rhythm, you know, a rhythm, like a ceremonial rhythm. We were all the team crying behind the camera because it was so real. And she was so pro to, she can tell us, even if her life was so hard, she she find a moment to to liberate herself. So um, it was a very very hard scene and and touching scene for us. You know, in throughout your your films, you've you've hire and center your stories on indigenous people, uh, Maya people in Guatemala, who were uh, the main victims of this genocide uh, for many decades. Do you feel that you know? by centering the stories uh, on indigenous people, you're sort of reclaiming a little bit of what's been taken, you know, so putting them on screen and, you know, telling those stories. Oh, to me, it's very important. You know, after that, there is a lot of radical groups, even in the indigenous people, there is a lot of people that think that you are appropriating their culture because they have to tell their own stories. And I have a mix in my, in my blog. So I have a part, Maya part too. And, and, and I don't believe that, that tell stories, even if you are not a, a woman to tell a, a feminine stories, is a wrong thing. Um, and I don't know if I'm helping these causes, but I'm sure that 
to fight against, against discrimination, that is the most big problem in my country, the first thing that we have to do is put line on that people and say that people exist even if you don't want to see them. Absolutely. Um, and with this, you know, your, your three films, uh, they're sort of a trilogy, right? That they center on this uh, insults that people use, you know, the first Xcano is about, you know, the word Indio, which means indigenous, and then Temblores uh, is a homophobic slur, and now it's communist. What is it about this, these three insults that you, you know, that it's important for you to talk about in the films? Oh, you know, I think these three insults, who is Indio, homosexual, and communist, communist, like I, I explained, already is are, are the proof that we are a society. And I think it's not just Guatemalan society. I think it's happening in all, all, all other countries. And it's the proof that we are just not proud about ourselves. And, and it's the proof that we are all the time dreaming to be other kind of people. But when I say other kind of people, it's not, it's not better people is be a is perpetuating that colonial colonialism uh, cost to us and and we have to cut with that and it's i don't have any problem with european people but i don't want to live all my life dream to be an european i want to be proud of that i'm that i am and european have to be proud about them and and ju just this equality that even advertising in Guatemala is so, so difficult to watch an advertising where it's not a white people, blonde people with blue eyes presenting a product. And they are telling you to be happy, you have to have that product and be white, blonde and blue eyes. And so you are, we are building sad people because that is impossible. Totally. Um, with that sort of, uh, you know, the, the idea of pride and, and, you know, being part of who you are, talk to me about the, the languages that we hear in the film and your decision to use, you know, because perhaps some people don't know that there's different uh, Maya languages that is not a unified language and we hear different ones in, in your film. Oh yeah, in Guatemala we, we spoke 20, 23 Maya languages. Uh, and and there is a thing that you know that that problem is so big that that people are stopped to talk in their language because because the country is not proud about that. So it's so sad. But in in the film, I wanted to use Ishil because the most the worst part of the genocide was in, in the Shield um, area. So I'm, I really use the language in, in my film. Uh, and after that, I use Kachikel because I grew, I grew up in a, in a Kachikel uh, region. And, and I grew up with a, my, my mother, uh, married a man when I was four, and, and his man was a Kachikel, and his family became my family. So I was, I was, I really lived with the Kachikel people, and, and it's a language that I really loved, and, and I'm trained all the time putting the language in my films. Uh, I put that in, in, in Tremors too, and, and Ishkanu was completely 90% 90, 90 uh, spoken in Kachikel. Amazing. Um, you know, throughout your, your three films, uh, the, the actress that has been with you throughout this journey, Maria Telon, you know, who plays the mother in Ishkano, who's also in, in Tremors and, you know, also in La Llorona now. Tell us about how, how she came to be sort of like one of your, your closest collaborators in, you know, these three films. Oh, yeah, the story is long with Maria Telon. Uh, I remember when I, when I discovered her, she was part of a group of street theater and and i really i was in front of a extraordinary force like an actress and and i called her to, to work with me in ishkanu 
and and we became friends, very good friends. And and she's a she's an actress who is very very totally um, controlling her body. You know, this kind of actress control her body, and and so it was so important to me to understand the way because she is an empiric actress. She had some formation, but in reality. She's a natural talent. And so I, I wanted to understand her technique and, and she started teaching me a little bit the way that she find to, to represent a character. And I was teaching her another way to, to represent a character and, and we build a kind of method together. And, and we really love to spend time together. So each time when I think in a film, I'm thinking and put her in, 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 in the story. And, but that, after that, it was, it, it's not only the story with Maria Telon because it's happened to me with a lot of my actors. I say my actors because with, with a lot <laughs> of the actors that I, that where I work and and it's, I, I have the, the feeling that we are building a kind of a family. Uh, you know, like, like Almodovar made in a moment, like Casavetes has in a moment. And so I'm, I'm really happy with that because, because in my country, there is not a, a real industry. Um, we are made in two films per year. So two, three, and so, we don't have a lot of actors and we don't have a lot of technicals. We have enough to make big projects, uh, but I, I, I'm protecting a little bit the fact that I don't want to have actors just for one shoot or one film. You know, I, I want to continue forming them, following their career and giving her more, more work. Another one of those actors uh, is uh, Sabrina de la Oz, who played a very different character in Temblores. And in, in La Llorona, he plays the daughter of this dictator, which to me is a very complex character. She's sort of caught up between, you know, uh, her family and what she really believes. Uh, tell us a little about this, this character and what she represents. Oh, Sabrina is a very, is a very good friend and she's, she's a photographer. And so for her, it was very complicated cross, cross from behind the camera to in front mm. of the camera. And, but I convinced her and I think it's a wonderful actress. She was forming in my, in my team too and, and we, we continue form, forming her and she, she's forming us at the same time. And the character in La Llorona, Natalia, I think is one of the more difficult character because it's representing my generation. And in my generation, because we are the, we, we was born in fear and we grew up in fear and we continue to be scared all the time because, because war, the war was there. And, and when the war was finished, if you talk too much, we, you, you could be disparate or, or eliminate. And so we continue with that traumas in our mind. So in a way, we had a lot of questions. We want to, we want to open doors. We want to, to cry some, some truths, but we, we still being a victim from, from the conflict. And so, I what, do, what do you say in English, tibio? Uh, you're lukewarm. Exactly. So I think for, a, for an actor, it's very complicated to represent a, char a character like that. Um, because all the time there is this line that even if you want to go up, you cannot because your character is not like that. And you, so I'm very, very proud about the work that Sabrina made in the film, just because I understood very well how difficult was the, the, the role. Totally. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the claustrophobic cinematography uh, in the film and what some of those choices that you made to make, you know, to enhance that experience of feeling trapped in this house? Oh, 
it was for us very important to understand the first question was the people who make that kind of massacres, they feel guilt or they feel guilty or, or they'll feel, they, they, or they really feel or, or look at them like heroes, you know, because normally in all Latin America, uh, dictators are continue telling that, that they are heroes. So um, that was the first question. And when we say for sure, for sure they have to feel guilty when they are inside the house. And how do you live with that? How do you live with that guilt in your house? And so we, are, we were thinking about the house like depression that they never visit. And, and we were thinking about the, the walls like, um, the walls, the, the windows, the doors, the old block, like in oppression, and, and to, to give them this claustrophobic uh, universe. And, and the only things to go through that walls was the water to, to try to clean that, you know. So, and La Llorona and water is one of the most important and like, iconic element from La Llorona. So, it was that kind of conversation that we had uh, at the beginning of the film. Totally. Do you feel, you know, I mean, in real life, like, like in the film, uh, despite being sentenced, you know, uh, the dictator didn't, you know, serve a, 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 the sentence, um, like in the film, but in the film, there's sort of a sense of justice that, that, you know, that's given because of the supernatural element. Was that sort of your intention to perhaps achieve justice in the fantasy in, you know, through magical realism, what didn't happen in real life? It was that in a, that in a way, and in another way is, even if it's shown under the fil filter of um, magical realism, is the reality of a lot of people in Latin America. So. In Latin America, there is not justice. Our states are almost inexistent. We don't have any control about um, about any problems that that is happening. People people came to the state just to to become rich. So, uh, in that reality, us like a, like a, like a people. The other solution, the only solution that we have is hope that there is a divinity who came and help us. And, and if you can understand people who are living in that kind of societies with a lot of problems and with, with no hope, uh, we are religious, we are we are feel, uh, we are believing in, in magical realism. We are we are looking for other kind of, of, of solutions, even if they're, they're, that solution are not real. It's just to, to have a little bit of peace in our in our mind and in our heart. We haven't talked about uh, Maria Mercedes Coroy, who plays you know this the title character in, in in La Llorona and who also was in your film, Ishkino. Uh, tell us about what did you ask from, from her for this particular role, being that she's like almost like a silent character throughout. Yeah, that's... I, I had all the time this, that, that souvenir in my mind when, when I met Maria Telon in, in the volcano and I was making the casting for Ishkino and this girl came to the casting and she, she has that kind of eyes, you know, like a bah, with that strong um, vision. And, and she, she doesn't have fear. So I really appreciate that when I met her. And when I was wor working on La Llorona, I said, Maria Mercedes is the perfect woman to you to present La Llorona like a Mayan princess with that kind of force coming from, from her inside. And, and when I 
called her to, to talk about the character, she told me, you know that my grandma tell me that during the war, uh, when the militars came to the town, she was hide and she, she learned to cry in silence. And she told me, I want to make a character. I, I want to make a Girona who doesn't cry in silence. And I want to make that character to be um, here by everybody. And, and when she told me that, I said, she is the good one. And, and, and I'm sure that she, she is the, the good one. Given that, you know, that this is such a, a delicate subject in your country, were you ever hesitant or concerned about making a movie about this subject? Oh, uh, there is a lot of subject here. <laughs> and and I, I want to continue working on that, but but I think there, you know, I, I'm not telling that each um, act, uh, artist has the responsibility to tell the story of, of or the memory of, of, a, of a country, but I'm, but in my case, when I know that the most of, of all the people are switching books to TV or movies, and all the people are, are switching culture to entertainment, I, I cannot say no about the fact that my works can be entertainment, but with a content. And, and in a way, I'm, I build my, my production company thinking that all the films that we will make have to be films to support human rights, to give light to the people who don't have light, to, to bring messages, to change things, to create impacts or, or something to be more relevant than, than just entertainment. And like you mentioned, your production company, La Casa de Producción, how did you get started? Was, was that always the, the mandate to make films with a, with a message from the beginning? Yes, you know, when I moved to, I, I, I lived the half of my life in Paris and I decided a moment to make films in Guatemala because I, I thought that in Guatemala my films will be more relevant than, than in Paris because in Paris the industry exists and, and I will make a French film, but, but I think make films in, in countries that histories are silence, stories are silence is more important. So I decided to come here and I look for a producer, but we didn't have a lot. So I asked to my mom, uh, do you want to be my producer? And she asked to me, what I have to do? <laughs> and I said, just work very hard. And she told me, okay. And we start both, we build both uh, our company and we start working together and, and we start learning together. Right now, we have a lot of people working with us and the people are professional and we are very happy with that. But at the beginning, it was my mother and, and we, were, we were focused on, on that kind of stories until, the, the, until the, the start. Did you, do you feel that, you know, it's been uh, probably about five years since Ishkenul, you know, came out at festivals and sort of made a big impact. I feel like that film sort of like positioned Guatemala cinema uh, internationally, you know, we hadn't seen a film uh, from Guatemala uh, of that caliber in a long time. Um, have you have you seen changes seen in terms of you know uh, the rights for indigenous people, how how discrimination has been tackled or addressed in Guatemala? Has has things changed in the in the course of the last five years? I think it's changing not only because movies or not only because my movies. It's changing because it's time, you know, it's time people are, uh, people have enough. So I think Mayan people are doing a lot to change that too. And, but movies are important because our impact can be bigger sometimes than, than other kind of arts. You know, music can be bigger, but can be very powerful too. And, and in Guatemala until now, the most, famous actress is for sure Maria Mercedes Coroy. So it, for a country who discriminate 
a indigenous people and they are for the first time proud because a Mayan woman is representing the country to me is a big change. So I'm very happy with that. Absolutely. Um, before we wrap up, I wanted to ask you about the reaction to the film in, in Guatemala uh, when it, I believe it premiered earlier this year in your country. What was the reaction from the press and from the audience to, to the film? Well, we had a, a lot of chance with the press because, um, because I think people who are working in media understand the importance of communication and they understand the importance of of have a mem historical memory and all that. So press are, are, are very, are supporting us. So thank you to press. And mm -hmm. after that, we have a kind of a public, you know, there even, in, even in, in societies like that, very conservative and very close, there is dissident. So all that dissident people are supporting us or that dis dissident people are following us and they are very happy with with our work and 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 we have thanks to them a kind of a small community to continue and to have kind of critics and I mean good critics, critics is always good. And but there is another part of the country that they are just um, ignoring the films because because they, they, they know how to do that very well. They are the master of the silence. And, and our, our work has to be continue pushing the films to push them in front of the film uh, and, and not let people escape, you know? Not because it's my film, it's because that film represents other things too. Absolutely. Um, I want to thank you, Heido, for so much time and also remind people that they can see La Llorona on Shutter now and they can see Tremors and Ixcano, uh on BOD online. So I feel like it's really, now that you have this trilogy completed, I feel like the body of work, uh, when it's you know seen together, it's really impactful. So I, I really uh, congratulate you on that. And thank you, thank so you much. again for... Thank you for being here with us today. And thank you to Film and Lincoln Center for having us. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.